My agency generates over $20 million in revenue every year. And today I'm gonna to be sharing a little bit of my history on how I got where I am. Um, this is gonna help other agency owners. Maybe you're a consultant, whether you're trying to figure out how to go full time, hire a first employee. And I'm also gonna be sharing my case study on my journey on how I got where I am today. So when I first started my agency, I had just gotten laid off from a lighting company. I was making over $200,000 per year. And the question that hit my mind was, have I peaked? I was thinking to myself, like, who in the world is going to hire the 30-year-old version of me who was making 200 k And I'm like, Am I, what, was I even worth what I was getting paid? Those questions were going through my head. Now, I, true, you know, looking back, it's very easy to say, yeah, of course I was, obviously, because I made a $20 million agency and whatever, and, and I have all these accolades in, in the past. But we all go through this experience where we wonder, where we have that self-doubt. Maybe you have imposter syndrome. There's a lot of challenges that we as human beings, quite frankly, go through as we're going through life, whether it's career, life, spiritual, or otherwise. And, and so this is the video to help you kind of walk through that. So when I had that question, have I peaked? It only took me 48 hours to get over it and, and to answer that question. Here is what I did. I made a LinkedIn post and I said, hey guys, I am going to be uh, doing some consulting for a little bit. You know, if you have any needs on Amazon, hit me up. Some of the questions going through my head was, will I ever replace that income? Would ever somebody hire me again for $200,000? And, and obviously, there's a lot of money. You know, I first want to take a self-reflection of the fact that I was highly successful at age 30. I was on the CMO track. I'd helped a handful of companies early in my career make millions of dollars, and I had a good track record. And so things were going well. I never really had any unemployment or uncertainty in a long time in my career. Obviously, everybody's been fired at least once from their job. And if you haven't, it's because you haven't been trying hard enough or getting into a hard enough situation or gotten down the wrong path or whatnot. But in any case, I was struggling with this. But when I made the LinkedIn post, I, was a, I had an immediate hit. I had a referral. And within eight hours, I was on the phone with a brand. And that brand is still with me today. I, I grew that brand on Amazon five and a half, six years ago now. And I took them from basically zero. They were like 4,000 a month in sales. And I took them to over well over $1.1 million, $1.1 million per month. So I turned them into an eight figure uh, brand and it just was going really super well. And, and so during that experience, within the first 90 days of starting consulting, I had a huge blessing, by the way. I was given a, a 90 day severance from my last job. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me in, in retrospect. I got laid off and I had 90 days of paid, go do whatever I need to do to figure out life and whatnot. A lot of people would have taken a vacation. A lot of people would have said, cool, I'm gonna take two weeks off and go take a break. That wasn't me. I immediately started a company. Now, there's a concept of burn your ships. In the year 1519, Hernan Cortez arrived in the New World with 600 men, and he made history by burning his ships. This sent a clear message to his men. There is no turning back, this article reads. Two years later, he succeeded in his complete conquest of the Aztec Empire. So this concept was basically he, he lands in the New World, and he unloads all the ships, and he turns to his men, and he, and he says, light them on fire. And what this forced everybody to do was realize there was no going back to the old world. They had to make success in the new world. Now, conquest aside and, and you know, attacking you know, native populations or whatever, uh, that part of the story is not relevant to, to what we're talking about. But what is relevant is the fact that when you burn your ships, you are forced to be successful. You have to do the hard thing. You have to place that cold call. You have to send that hard email. You got to fire that employee you've been thinking about firing. You got to do the tough stuff, right? And, and so as an agency, it is ridiculously difficult. Like nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to start an Amazon agency. Nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to do the toughest service-based job ever. It just doesn't happen. What does happen is layoffs, or what does happen is side hustle consulting. So 
Before I started my agency, I had side hustle consulted for well over five years. Basically, I worked for a handful of failed startups in five years, and what would happen is I'd make a good impact, I'd, I'd do my job, but for whatever reason, a startup would fail, right? It was always the other guy, of course. Uh, but the blessing that I had is I made these strong relationships, and they would take my re reference, they would go to the next company, these VPs of the companies I worked at that failed, and they would ask me to help them there. And then I would start doing side hustle consulting. They didn't have a full-time role or whatever. Well, it turned out over five years, I had done 25 different consulting gigs. Now, at the time, when I did the side hustle consulting, I was doing like $2,000 projects, one-page sheet agreements. I'd charge you for my time on the phone, meetings, and I'd go into the account and do a few things, right? Well, when I got laid off, I signed my first full-service account and it was for $3,000 flat per month immediately. And that contract that I signed is still intact today, five and a half years later. We still service the account. Now, I was just my Amazon guy initially, and today, obviously, I've got 430 some odd employees and well over that amount, 400 and some odd brands that we manage, uh, and it's been great. And we produced $20 million in ARR. So the story has a great ending, and obviously I'm not done yet, and I'm gonna try and hit 50 million. What got me to 20 million is not gonna get me to 50. I gotta, I gotta hit my next plateau. I gotta go do my own hard stuff. But back then, that first $3,000 contract was really tough. And I had to go in and work on a supplement company. I had to go in and work on 80 SKUs that had problems. The, they had recycled UPCs. They, they had uh, all kinds of catalog problems that took like 10, 20 different tickets to get sorted in the catalog. It was some of the dirtiest catalog work you could possibly imagine, right? And so I was like, man, why would I want to do this work? I, I had this cushy 200K job where I, I sat in the ivory tower and shouted orders and made deals and you know managed PPC and whatever, right? Why would I want to do this super dirty catalog work? And so in that first two weeks, I was just like, man, maybe I should back out of this. What am I doing? And then a thought came across me. What if I hired somebody? Right? It's, it's obvious in the that, you know, you're looking back. But at the time, you're just like, but I only have $3,000 in monthly income. How could I afford somebody? R r remind, remember, I was making well over six, seven times that. Um, on a monthly basis, how could I afford to hire my first employee? But that's exactly what I did. If I hadn't have hired that employee, I would have burned out doing catalog work, first of all. So I hired an employee and I had um, a, a, a makeshift office that we created. There was a guest bedroom at my house and we, we took the bed out, we put in uh, one of those fold up tables, didn't even have a real desk at this point and started making phone calls. And I said, you know anybody? And, and I got a summer uh, hire, um, almost like an internship, if you will. I paid them 13 bucks an hour. They were somebody that was a friend of a friend at church, and they were an amazing employee. Now, this particular person ended up becoming a nurse. Uh, I wasn't their long-term plan. But they were really good with Excel, and they started filing the tickets, and they were in the same room with me, and it was very easy for me to know exactly what to do with the catalog problems, and I'd turn over and, and say, go do it. Well, then I started realizing, okay, I've got this one client down, I'm good to go, what else can I do? And I started hitting hard all of my references, and I, I went out, and I think it was like five days in um, to, to consulting in this arrangement that I realized that like, hmm, Maybe there's something to this. And so I was doing laundry with my wife uh, and she looked at me and I looked at her and, and she said, well, you know, what if what if you did this full time? And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. But she said, but you, you've had all this success with this consulting. Like, and I'm like, yeah, I guess. And, 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 and Emily, my wife, she says, well, how do people normally introduce you? And I'm like, they don't really care who I am. They just say, come, go talk to my Amazon guy and then refer me out. And I was like, wait a minute. That's my company name. Now, the first person I hired was female, and it was, of course, a weird dichotomy of like, oh, yeah, come work at my Amazon guy, uh, you know, work it out of my house, right? But the first 10 people that I hired were basically church, friends. Uh, I, 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 can you imagine what it was like for me when I was doing interviews with people off LinkedIn or Indeed? 
Yeah, um, hi, I'm running this boutique agency, and uh, I need you to come interview with me at my house. Uh, I'm not going to murder you or anything like that. Just, just walk in uh, down the stone steps on the side of the house, come into the back of my basement, and come talk to me about uh, what it would be like to run a marketing agency, this Amazon thing you've probably not even heard of. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs> and, and so I had some remarkable hires, but I also had some hires that didn't work out. I also had some people who were like, yeah, I'm not interested in working in your basement. Now, mind you, I ended up uh, you know, investing um, a lot of money into finishing out a basement. I built it for a corporate world uh, track. I built a, a, a sub kitchen down in my basement, had nice windows. It was really great looking actually. Um, more comfortable than a rather norm, you know, a, a regular corporate environment. It worked out very well for me, but it was weird, right? Like trying to convince talent to come in. One day, um, I get a knock on the door, and it's the fire marshal for the city that I work that I lived in, and they they said, "Hey, uh, you see these eight cars in the cul-de-sac?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I see the eight cars in the cul-de-sac." Yeah, he's like, "Yeah, we know they work for you. We've been marking down license plates. We've been we've been we've been watching you." And I said, "Okay." And and then he said, "Yeah, you you can't do that." You can't have that many people working at your house. You're going to have to vacate the property uh, with all of your employees within the next 48 hours. And I said, okay, yeah, you're right. I probably can't do that. I probably started pissing off the neighbors. Um, and, you know, a couple of neighbors were fine with it. But then when we got that seventh or eighth car in, the, the, the next neighbor probably wasn't cool with it, right? So I had to figure out what to do. Uh, I sent all of my employees remote within 48 hours. It was one of the most difficult tasks that we did. Um, trying to figure out how we were going to make it work and and deal with that process. But it did work. And we went remote. And then it dawned on me, why am I hiring people within only my city? Why don't I hire people outside of my state? What if I started hiring, I don't know, this thing called virtual assistants? And I started hiring people out of the Philippines. That was one of the biggest, most helpful things ever to my business um, it helped my margin, it helped my talent pool, and I could hire anybody in the world at this point. And I made the decision that I wasn't going to go find a new physical location. I was just going to go remote. And that was a big change for me, um, and it was very difficult to make that happen. Um, you know, kind of looking back, by day 90 of me starting my consulting, I was already making $45,000 a month in MRR, monthly reoccurring revenue. I was instantly a hit, highly successful initially, but it took me a long time to still burn my ships. I was still interviewing for jobs after day 90. It was like right around day 120, 150, maybe even as long as six months in before I physically burned my ships and stopped doing interviews. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go all in on this agency thing and do it. Now, I made some really good early decisions in my agency. I started making video content day one, and my phone started ringing off the hook. I actually put my cell phone number into some of my earlier videos, and I got calls off of it. Here's how to make a brand store. Here's how to make A-plus content. Here's how I fix this random error on, on um, your brand store that bugs it out, and how to fix a brand note ID, and many, many other things that I had to learn how to do that were very difficult early on. Anytime I got a customer question, I shot a video and put it on YouTube. Content was one of the most successful things that I did um, early on. I'm super thrilled about the end result of that. Um, would absolutely do it the same way. I would have also gone remote faster, would have hired uh, virtual assistants day one, and made um, an acceleration of the decisions that I eventually went and ended up doing. All right, so let's look at a case study next. Here is kind of some of the numbers. Um, th these are the actual numbers of my business. Um, pulling up full screen so you guys can check, check this out. So in the first, um, I, my business started on April 2nd of 2018. I made $361,000 uh, in the first six, eight months of my business. Did really, really great. Had three employees, 10 clients. World was awesome. Really happy. 
2019, I tripled it. 2020, I doubled it. 2021, basically tripled it again. 2022, basically doubled it again. 2023, almost doubled it yet again. Just as one thing after another, um, there's a couple of key dates here. So April 2nd, 2018 was the first clients. Um, I, you know, the January of, I think it was like, uh, it was probably like March or April of 2021. I onboarded HubSpot. So I didn't even need a CRM uh, until I was at $6 million. Uh, I've seen a lot of other LinkedIn sales gurus say similar things that you really don't need a CRM until you hit that six, maybe even as late as $10 million. Um, you can use JotForm, Google Sheets, no problem. Uh, shortly after that, uh, you know, later in 2021, I ended up building what I call a sales calculator to figure out how to bid any contract, any deal within seconds. And then I was able to build an outbound sales team um, that did really good. So this is this is some of the cool things that we did. And um, here you can see where we're at in 2023 with over 420 clients, over 450 uh, employees. So I had a lot of fun building this out, and we're going to walk through how I scaled it all. So uh, I have over 46,000 followers on LinkedIn, 4.5 million views on YouTube, uh, and you don't have to try and recreate or try and figure this out on your own. You can get help. You can you can use somebody else's playbook. So here is a very common quad that people talk about when they're trying to figure out how to build their agency um, or how to how to get clients. This this works for any business really. So quad number one, worm outreach. This is one to one. People you know is in the red. In the blue, we got strangers. But in the first quad, this is worm outreach. So. If you look back to what I, I mentioned earlier in the video, I made a LinkedIn post. I started talking to people that I knew. I went, I did side hustle consulting for five years. I had references built. That's boom. That's what I did. This is what I did to get to $1 million. The second quad is content, one to many. Those are the YouTube videos, the social posts, lots and lots of content. And this is how I got to $10 million. Um, took me, what was it, two years, three years to get to that point? Yeah, three, actually full four years to get to that $10 million mark. So basically, uh, first year and a half, all warm outreach. I was doing content, it accelerated it, but essentially content did the bulk of the inbound. I had 50 people a week asking me for help. Wasn't hard to convert a few of those. Then uh, I started to do cold outreach. This is one to many strangers or one to one, uh, rather one to one strangers, cold outreach. And I bought leads and I started paying an outbound sales team to do business development work and go out and chase them. Uh, and this has been what got me from 10 million to 20 million. Now I am stuck at 20 million right now, wondering how am I going to get further up? And this is how I'm going to do it. I'm gonna run paid ads. I have yet to crack how to run paid ads for my service-based consulting agency. Uh, and that may be sound a little weird, but that that's true. I know how to market a product all day long, but marketing a service is a totally different animal. How do you even target Amazon sellers in paid media? Very difficult. I, I, I've done some test spins. I did like $20,000 in YouTube ads and my videos ended up playing on kids cartoon shows. And I was like, how is this possible? Well, what I theorized was is that I, I would hit the ad and the Amazon sellers were mom and pops. They'd hand their phone off to their kids and their kids were watching Netflix all day or YouTube videos. I, I have no idea. Uh, but but it's been hard to figure out whether the advertising was effective and you have to build landing pages and webinar funnels and all that good stuff. So that's where I'm working on. This is what's going to get me to 50 million. So this is the quad people that, you know, one to one warm outreach, go into content. And as you work through this quad from top left, bottom left, top right, bottom right, you if you go in the same order that I did, it is the most cost effective. And the reason for that is obviously paid ads are the most expensive. It's going to hurt your margin. Uh, cold outreach is a lot of work. You got to build a team to do that. But you could do the left hand side, the ones, the, the ones in red ink here, all by yourself without any help. You can do this all by yourself. And so that's basically what I did. I've been doing content all the time. And part of the reason I'm sharing this story is because now I'm giving away the content on how I built my Amazon guy, 
And now I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, I've got a free case study. If you guys want to see the full case study, go to myguy.agency slash case, and you can check it out. But for those that need some specialized help, maybe you're at that million dollar mark and trying to crack how to go to the next spot. We have created a special program um, that we're selling to you now. So for $2,000, you can get all of my agency operations. This is all of my SOPs on how to run an agency. These are specifically built for Amazon agencies, but there, you know, if you're not an Amazon agency or an e-com agency, there's probably some value there for you as well, like how to set up some automations, how to use Zapier, Slack, Asana, processes on basically what took me from six figures, seven figures, eight figures. You get the idea. All the systems that you need to figure it out. Um, these are early adopter prices right here, and if you act now, you'll be able to lock that in for lifetime access. We will likely switch this to a licensing um, annual subscription at a later point after the program is built, but anybody that buys it now is going to get a lifetime access. Sales Accelerator Program, we're going to charge a lot more for this. This is going to be $10,000. It includes everything in the agency operations. By the way, if you buy the 2K program, yes, at a later point, you can upgrade to the Sales Accelerator for the cost difference of eight grand. No problem. Just send us an email. And in the Sales Accelerator Program, uh, you get all of my cold call scripts, how a copy of my actual contract that I've been sending people, um, how... I built all of my sales team, how I hired for business development, how I hired and trained account executives, and all of the program um, on, on how I went from that 10 mil to the 20 mil mark is part of the sales accelerator program. So I'm going to go back to uh, the case study and talk more about it. But if you guys are interested in that, please feel free to reach out. My sales email, uh, if you want to contact us, you can, you can click the contact us button at the top of the agency website, or you can email sales at my, uh, actually I have to think about this for a second, because uh, I have a weird domain name, myguy.agency. It is in fact sales at myguy.agency. It took me a second, I had to think about that. Um, all right, so let's go back through the rest of the case study. Uh, somebody already, already purchased uh, myagencyguy.com, what do you do? Uh, I'd never spent money on a domain name purchase. I probably will at some point. <laughs> so if you know who owns that. All right. So, so walking through more of the case study here, warm outreach. I talk about you know, my LinkedIn post and, and what got us there and, and how, um, you know. And by the way, LinkedIn's got these really cool um, tags now where you can become top advertising voice. Um, content generation, definitely a good thing. I made daily videos on YouTube. I, I have like 2,000 videos on YouTube to hit those 4.5 million views uh, and well over a, a great amount of podcasts and educational content. I now run four weekly podcasts um, that my team does um, and they keep the content generation going. And you, you know, when you first put on one of your employees to run a podcast, they do a terrible job, like just really awful. So one of my um, key employees is Jason Master Mateo. I'm going to go over and show you his coaching link. Um, so this is his face right there. And Jason, when he first did his first AMA uh, agency Amazon um, podcast, it was atrocious. It was just really, really bad. But after he did about 100 of them, he was as good as me. And then we did the same thing with Thomas. And then we're doing the same thing with Marissa and Faith and, and, and Joseph and others. Um, and, and by the way, never lose a customer. We have coaching on demand if, 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 you, if those that need help running their Amazon businesses at myamazonguy.com slash coaching. And we built this out because it was effective on how um, to, to, to train my staff on how to replicate me and replace myself. Right, so we created all those videos. We have my team running a lot of the videos themselves. It's been great. I make daily LinkedIn posts. In fact, I, I average about 2.7 uh, posts a day on LinkedIn, uh, and it's been highly effective in, in trying to reach my audience. But the YouTube videos has been the most effective. LinkedIn has been second. Um, I haven't really done anything with Twitter and Instagram. Uh, but I do know others that have. So we created the live um, AMAs, and you can see we have, you know, ask me anything for PPC and ask any Amazon question. We even do ASIN review live, which is where we look at Amazon listings. So we did all that. 
So content is king. I always will be making content. It keeps the machine going and it's super cheap to make. So then we built the outbound sales system. I did all the sales in the first two years. Year three, I hired my father. Uh, and that's a weird dynamic by itself. Uh, usually the father hires the son. It is very rare for the son to hire the fa father. Um, but what was awesome is even though whether my dad is a good salesman or not is inconsequential because what happens on these sales calls is um, they say, oh, I watched Steven's videos, 20 of his videos. You must be a really proud father. And he's like, yeah. And they spend 15 minutes talking about that. And then, then they get down to business and they've built a really strong rapport. Uh, and, and so that was really effective, but that, you know, obviously he tapped out. So I had to hire more people. So my sales team today has over 30 people. Um, I, I had to hire, uh, you know, in year four, I had tw 12 AEs and BDRs and today we're at 30 to give you an idea. Um, cold outreach PPC. This is where I'm going to head next. Uh, very difficult. Uh, no idea if my YouTube ads helps and we're, we're building all kinds of content and, um, proof you can get to $20 million without running a single paid ad, essentially. Uh, you know, I, I've ran multiple $10,000 tests here and there, to be clear, though. So sales process and all of the sales process um, that takes to get through all of that contract types. When I first started out, I did flat rate deals. Um, as a consultant, I would even do just hourly deals and do like a pay me two grand and, um, you know, over three months, whatever, it didn't matter. Uh, and then when I started doing monthly flat deals in year one, two, uh, year three, I started to change to a small flat rate with a high revenue share. And then this would incentivize the clients to fire me when I succeeded. And I, I was like, oh man, this was a terrible idea. And I immediately got rid of that. Year four, I landed on medium flat rate, but plus small revenue share. And that's where I've been ever since, like one to 3%. I won't do a deal higher than 3% revenue share. I just won't do it. Because after you get them to a million dollars per month, you run the math, they are incentivized to fire you super fast. So um, I created a lot of jobs over time. Um, I was able to create um, an additional 100 jobs when I went to from 200 employees to 300 employees. And I did that in about eight months. One of the keys that I did was use what I call a big, hairy, audacious goal. That's um, you know, a really big goal that a lot of people struggle to wrap their head around. And we hired essentially um, 100 interns in 45 days. And most of those were out in the Philippines. Um, and it was one of the most successful initiatives I've ever done. One of the most things I'm most excited about. And it's super crazy. <laughs> because how do you train all these people? Well, one of the things that I did to train all those people is I made this certificate program called Mag School, mag-school.com. And these certificates on all of the courses for anything to, that I needed to, to run an agency. So for SEO, PPC, catalog, design, logistics, launching, reviving, reinstatement, brand registry, parentage, just on and on and on. I made a course for everything that you could possibly need. And uh, it's been a very you know, good uh, journey and everything that we've been able to do. I had to figure out how to train leaders along the way as well. <clears throat> that was one of the hardest things to do. I think the average leadership training that is given to managers in the United States is like two or three hours a year. I was doing two or three hours a day when I first started hiring leaders and I was teaching them how to do everything. Uh, I made an SOP on literally every function that I could possibly think of. I even wrote an SOP on how you should never apologize. Uh, no, seriously, like I made a video on that one too. If you Google never apologize by Amazon guy, you'll find it. I made a I made an SOP about zero unread inbox and how you can never let your inbox pile up. I made a video on that. You can Google that one as well. Um, and so I turned every concept that I felt like was important into content videos, into SOP, standard operating procedures. And then I taught my staff relentlessly to follow my system and process. Then I had to hire people to make sure we kept following the system and process. So I had to hire people how to train. I had to hire people how to manage, maintain systems. Uh, it's been a, a long ride in the process and a lot of fun and a lot of grueling 
effort, uh, not easy to run an agency. Nobody ever wakes up and says, I want to run an agency. It just kind of happens sometimes. And there's plenty of room and space in, in the environment for a lot of um, agencies and consultants to exist. I'd say what, you know, if we look at the world map, um, the place that I'm finding the most agencies pop up right now is in Europe. Um, and so I talked to a guy from Hungary the other day, uh, Germany, United Kingdom, lots and lots of agencies popping up in Europe because Amazon is growing so fast in Europe right now that there's room for the talent to manage those accounts and do those things. And so I launched my agency in the United States in 2018. That was a golden era for launching agencies in the USA. And likewise, we saw a lot of agencies be made in the United States at that time. So now we're seeing that golden era go over to Europe and European agencies supporting European um, businesses selling on Amazon in Europe specifically. So in any case, I launched all of these things to help do that. Another thing that I do that's special part of my case study is I never lose a customer. And some of the things that we do, obviously we are a full service customer uh, base. That's where I make the bulk of my money. If you go to myamazonguy.com slash FS, that's for full service, you can see quickly um, that we have a very large flywheel. And we go into a great detail about all of the services that we offer. We, in fact, give away all of our trade secrets right here. If you're an agency, you want to replicate my stuff for free, feel free, have at it. It's very difficult to do, by the way. Um, but it's there. And if you're talented, you can pull it off. Um, so in here, we have all of this information so that the consumer can feel very comfortable on why and what they're going to do, what their experience is going to be like. Like we even walk through what onboarding looks like, optimization, what results they can expect, videos on every single topic and, and galore on how somebody's going to have an experience with my company. So the concept of never lose a customer, big flywheel. I even started selling trademarks for crying out loud. I'm not a lawyer, um, but I figured out how to do that. I have filed over 2,000 trademarks. This is something that every single Amazon business needs. Uh, and it's been challenging with all the brand registry changes that they're doing. Um, we then have my refund guy, which is basically a way to recover um, lost shipments. And so we even created like side businesses on all kinds of things. Uh, we offer coaching calls so that you can get on demand, things like that. I even sell, send me an email for $50 and I'll answer your question. I actually got one of those this, this morning asking about hijackers on his Amazon listings. And, and so I have made well over $20,000 just on ask me a $50 question to give you some standpoint, right? A Alex Ramosi says, um, customers that are paying you to become customers, yeah, like that's awesome. You should take that all day long, right? Uh, and so I'm always constantly trying to figure out like how to gain um, respect early on with early adopters, early Amazon sellers who have you know, sales 20K a month, but they're not, they can't afford my full service management when they're at 20K a month. They can barely afford it at 50K a month, right? So we create all these a la carte services. Um, and I do about 10, 11% of my business with a la carte projects. As a full service agency, I have to have a dedicated staff team. Um, I think it's like 36 people, maybe as much as 50 people dedicated to just project orders. In addition to that, we have the coaches like this, uh, and it, it can be very difficult because a lot of the times some of the worst um, customers and some of the worst deals that you'll take will come on troubleshooting topics. Troubleshooting topics like account reinstatement, listing reinstatement. Sometimes these tasks take 30 or 45 days and you know we charge a thousand bucks to do it, uh, but it can be very problematic uh, and challenging. And sometimes we don't make money on these deals. And so do you want to take a deal like that as an agency? You have to have some really strong cojones to want to be able to do that, right? Like you have to, to, to battle the lost dogs of Amazon. That's, that is tough work, right? A lot of uh, agencies decide, you know what? I don't want to touch catalog. I'm just going to do PPC only uh, because of that. And I, 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 I can't blame them, quite frankly. I mean, it's a lot of work uh, to do that. But I made the choice that I was going to do all of these services, gigantic flywheel, never lose a customer and offer as many potential avenues as possible. Sometimes I have some free stuff. I even started selling SOPs on Amazon, how to run all of the things on Amazon. 
when I started selling these, I, I started getting emails from former employees. Like, is, is the ship going under? Is, is the business falling apart? Right. And I, I was like, no, I don't know why you're asking about that. Right. Like, no, I'm an education company that happens to be an agency. This is totally on brand for me. Uh, in fact, uh, what I found was that half of the businesses that were buying my Amazon SOPs were other agencies. And that was fascinating to me. And I was like super interested in this. And I was like, well, now I can double my customer base by helping other agencies as well. It's not me against you. It's all of us against Amazon. And, and so now my vehicle is getting bigger and bigger. The vehicle in which I can access revenue and sell other people and be able to, to, to start a business is getting bigger and bigger and that allows me to create a mini empire of sorts and control my own destiny. I obviously have burned my ships. I'm never gonna go work back for the man. Uh, and you know, it's been a really good experience so far. And so um, a lot of people would just keep to themselves. They don't wanna reveal their trade secrets. Um, and that does work, but it doesn't scale. Uh, if you keep everything to yourself, if you decide not to make content, if you don't sell your information, um, you're, you're gonna be not having as many customers. I guarantee that, that's a fact. Um, but those businesses do work and you can charge a premium if you don't share your information. It's just, nobody's gonna know about it. That's the challenge, right? We're in an information age, so I embrace that. So we did all kinds of things um, on how, how never to lose a customer, offer all kinds of things. Now here's a concept that I highly recommend uh, and that is never, um, never lose a customer by giving customers what they want, right? If, if you ignore the competition like I did and never pay attention to them, you are way better off. Here is why. This is a blue ocean versus red ocean strategy, right? If you want to go for the whole big blue ocean, you need to just simply ask customers this question. What do you want? Okay, you want XYZ? I can give you XYZ. Here it is. Take it. <clears throat> and then start charging them for it and constantly asking your current customer base, what should I stop doing? What should I start doing? And what do you want me to do more of? And if you keep that feedback loop, like I force my clients to, to complete a client survey every 90 days. The reason I do this is I know some customers are upset. Of course, it's a service-based company. I'm gonna have customer complaints almost every day. That's just the fact of running uh, a service-based organization. It'd be like running a restaurant. Of course, you're going to have a daily complaint, right? That's what you. That's what you're built to do. How you handle that is part of the process. And the best thing you can do to be offensive while running an agency is to ask customers constantly, "How am I doing? What can I do better?" and and fix it and give them what they're looking for. Um, and sometimes it customizes a little bit outside of your comfort zone and, and they ask for things that you don't do as a business, but it's okay to say no. But when, when they're asking for things like, Hey, could we switch the reporting from this format to that format? That can be really easy to accomplish, right? Or if you get them to rate your PPC, your design, your catalog, your growth, and they give you a two on PPC, but they give you a 10 on design. You may need to update your contract and stop servicing their PPC and just stick to design for them and downgrade the contract. And then your customer who was unhappy and thinking about canceling all of a sudden is ecstatic and is, is singing your praises. And when you have happy customers, they tell other customers, right? Um, even if you have a high churn business model and as an agency, many agencies do have high churn uh, and that's okay as long as you set up the expectations with the customer and give them the ability to turn on a positive note, it doesn't negatively affect you. And that's kind of where I've been as a business, right? Like I probably lose more customers every month than most businesses gain in a year. And that's because at our scale, we are focused on serving as many people as possible and trying to get as many salmon over the dam, so to speak, when um, when they're going through the salmon run. But I don't expect every single salmon to get over the dam. We don't spend 80% of our time trying to please the 20% of the fringe cases. <clears throat> but we do ask all of our customers, what do you want? And we try and give it to them. So ignore the competition. You don't have to go to Amazon conferences. You can just simply ask customers what they want and go and give it to them. So uh, 
We have a lot of people that apply at my agency. Well over 100,000 people applied at my Amazon guy in the last two years. That's a lot of applications. Part of my secret to processing that amount of applications has been to use what's called culture index. I am probably one of the most advanced zealots when it comes to using personality profiling within my business. Some of you are just like, oh, personality profiling, is that illegal? Um, no, in fact, there have been Supreme Court cases that indicate that when you use personality profiling as part of your application process, it actually increases the culture and protects against um, any sort of uh, bias. Uh, so we use data only. We obviously aren't looking at, uh, at race, gender, or any ideology outside of that. It's simply, um, are you programmed to be naturally happy in the environment that I have built? And we know that in certain roles, an introvert is going to do better than an extrovert. We know that in other roles, an extrovert is gonna do better than an introvert. And so we have guidelines where we look for certain personality traits in every specific role. And this has been one of the best processes. Um, our culture index auto rejects 63% of people that apply to work at my company because I know these profiles are not built to, to work in a service-based industry where you have customers who are gonna eat your lunch if you don't give them what they want, right? So I look for very specific things and each role is a little bit different. I never stopped hiring. I created evergreen roles and that's allowed me to grow about 8% every single month. And um, because we have so much content in the space, here's what happened. We had um, tutorials on how to do anything in an Amazon situation, anything to fix a listing. And so virtual assistants that would work at my competition or work at a small uh, you know, Amazon brand would use my content to figure out how to do their job. And they're like, well, if they have all the knowledge, I wanna go work there. And so the content strategy that I uh, developed ended up helping me hire people. Um, some of my best talent found me through content development. And that's kind of, cool if you think about it. It's like now you have job ads out there in the space running around, right? So anybody that wants to work at my company, they can go to myamazonguy.com slash jobs, and I'm always taking applications. Now, it may be hard to get into my company, but for those that do, it's a really great fit. One of the other things that's really unique about what I do is core values. Something that I do relentlessly is talk about core values. I'm doing things like give away $25 gift card every single day basically at MAG um, for people nominating other people for representation of core values. So learning, obviously the number one reason somebody joins my, an education company is to learn. I am an education company that happens to be an agency, therefore my number one core value is learning. We also look for people who are eager beavers, that are tech savvy. That's the Google Drive logo right there. Consistent communication uh, and traction. And traction is our newest core value. I do think it's okay to change your core values from time to time. I call them campaigning, right? I am campaigning to change behavior. What behavior do you want to drive in your staff and your employees? And so this is what I did. Um, is I, I make core values to drive specific, explicit behavior that I'm seeking. And then I, I, I made all these core values and I was like, oh, this is awesome. One day I realized I needed some additional behaviors specifically from my managers. So I made manager values to help my leaders train. And multiply yourself is the newest leadership uh, manager value that I built. Replace yourself to scale at mag, one plus one, equals three. And, and so this is procreation of other leaders, leaders at MAG, right? One plus one equals three. Think about that math for a minute. And, and so I wanted to make sure that when people are measuring their effectiveness at my organization, my best managers, my best leaders are trainers. My best leaders create other leaders and train each other, right? I also need them to be soft on the people, right? Surf soft, if you will. And I wanted um, them to not ever yell at somebody. I wanted them to treat everybody with respect and sincerity. That culture 
a, a retains talent. It's, it is a very important thing. When we have people nominated for manager values, um, 80% of the people end up nominating somebody for being soft on the people. That's how much they love soft on the people leadership. At the same time, you got to be tough on the issues, right? And, and if you're going to climb Mount Everest or climb that mountain, you got to be tough and hold people accountable because if they make mistakes and you don't tell them and you don't show what concerns you have, then the culture deteriorates and it harms everything within the system. It's very difficult to be both soft on the people but tough on the issues. It takes a very particular manager who can deliver those accountability things without being a raging arsehole, right? And so that's one of the things that I think is super critical to get right and to figure out. And so that's why we have that balance between soft on the people and tough on the issues. But to emphasize that tough on the issues, sometimes you have to take what's called extreme ownership. Now, you will notice that several of the things you see on the screen here, traction, extreme ownership, and radical candor are all books. And if you look up traction, if you look up extreme ownership, you look up radical candor, you will find tutorials on how to run these core values. Um, and so I did this because part of my campaigning was to get people to read those books. Those books are some of the best books that helped me uh, run my own business. And Extreme Ownership, chapter two, if you only read one chapter in Extreme Ownership, this is the chapter to read. It talks about how there's no such thing as a bad team. There is only such a thing as a bad leader. And you have to look inwardly to figure out whose mistake or whose fault it is when something doesn't go right. Um, so Jocko does a really good job of explaining how certain, you know, war missions and whatever else don't, doesn't go right. And he, he learned it was like, you know, there's nobody to blame. I'm to blame. Radical candor, feedback faster is part of the radical candor uh, managing trait. Because what would happen is somebody would come to me and say, you know, I have this challenge with my employee. And I say, cool, did you tell them? And they'd be like, well, no, I'm thinking about it. And then five days would go by and they finally tell them. And it was like old news. And by then, it wasn't an effective thing. So I, I, um, I have Spock's uh, hand sign right here. Um, a lot of people joke that I'm a robot at my company, um, and I kind of am in some ways. And I speak my mind all the time to my people, and they expect it, and I, I surround myself with people <clears throat> who are comfortable with that, who embrace that, <clears throat> who like having a Spock around, right? And then I also ask them to do the same thing and, and to not hold it in. So... Um, being able to speak that candor and, and do things. And then we created a scoring system on how to go about doing all that. Um, now, we're getting to some bonuses now. These are things that I tried that did not work for me. Um, I hired a PR agency. I got 100 interviews in 60 days. Definitely didn't help me get any clients. It was fun for a little bit, but after that 20th interview, it got old. Did 100, uh, 100 radio and TV spots. I've been in the Washington Post. I've been in all kinds of things. I also never bought another agency. I do hear about a lot of roll-up strategies, and, and that is a strategy. There's some people that are really good at M&A and pulling in people together. This is not my skill set. I never bought another agency. I did acquire a small one-man band maximizing e-commerce. Kevin Sanderson joined me because I was the 50% of all the people that signed up for his summit came from my audience anyway, so it made sense to acquire his business. Um, I also didn't really do any partnership creating. Um, I didn't do affiliates. I didn't do partnerships. I did try um, to sponsor one podcast, and I had many offers to sponsor my podcast. Um, that These are things uh, that I tried that didn't work. Um, taking sponsors for my own podcast would have been cool early on, but I'm glad I didn't. It allowed me to never have ads in my own video content. I, I tried to expand into Facebook and Google services, but I learned that staying niche to the Amazon to be an inch wide and a mile deep was very effective for me, um, and I'm glad I did that. Um, and then what I am trying to figure out how to, to figure out is uh, PPC for the agency. That's my 2023 Q4 goal, things I'm working on. Here are some of the worst mistakes that I ever made. I spent $2 million trying to build my own AI um, build my own CRM, project management, time tracking, PPC management, automation, software. It never went live. I wasted $2 million. Uh, and so <laughs> those are some of the mistakes I made. 
I have other video content you guys are going to want to check out next about how um, I take live Q&A and you can watch those. Those are really cool. I also have some bonuses here on the books that I recommend. You guys can check that out at the bottom of the case study page at myguide.agency slash case. Uh, and those are books and which ones helped me in which year. So you can kind of put together the story for everything that's that's gone down. Um, come in and ask me anything. I, I, I'm going to be doing more of those video AMAs. You can leave a comment on this video. I will also come back and answer it as well. And I look forward to serving you other Amazon agencies. My name is Stephen Pope. I'm the founder of My Amazon Guy, a $20 million agency. And I'm now the CEO of My Agency Guy, here to serve other agencies. Ask me anything.